Hey, hey, everybody, you probably saw me show up on your screen. No sound at first. Don't be alarmed. I promise you now that my lips are moving, you should be able to hear me. <laughs> um, how you doing? It's Chuck Ruffin. We are on What's Up Wednesday on What's Up Chuck. Going to be covering a few things today. Um, I'm trying to do this twice a week. Maybe go down to once a week in the future. But Mondays and Wednesdays as of right now until my schedule changes next week. And then it'll be on whatever day I actually schedule and put in the group. So, again, uh, thanks for everyone that shows up on these. Today's theme is a little bit different. Um, I focus on what's going on with me throughout the week and whatever questions are posed. And I hope that um, whoever chimes in or jumps on here and asks any questions, um, you know, I can interact with you guys and kind of share my experiences with what's going on so today I want to take a moment to recognize what type of day it is um, I actually didn't realize that Wednesday was going to be the 11th of September um, so I wanted to share a story about what this day means to me as far as my experiences whenever uh, the fateful day happened in 2001 um, on the 11th of September 18 years ago I was, uh, had just graduated high school in 2001. I recently moved to Kentucky. And at that time, after I recently moved, I was starting college pretty much right off the bat. Uh, I enrolled into West Kentucky Tech Community College right there in Paducah, Kentucky. I was going to school part-time, paying for classes out of my own pocket. And, you know, of course, this is just kind of like any other day for me. Um, I was trying to figure out what I was going to be doing throughout the day, so I'm on break in between classes, and, you know, as I'm on break between classes, I'm a, a big car guy, and I was into car stereo stuff, so I went up to this car stereo shop that was in Paducah. I don't even know if it's still there anymore, but as I walk inside, the guys have a television going on. Um, it's not a flat screen panel TV up on the wall. At this time, it was a small tube TV sitting in the corner and the guy was just sitting there watching it and I was like what's going on you know he had the news going and he goes oh a plane just crashed into the World Trade Center in New York and I'm 18 years old I graduated high school from Missouri the only connection to New York that I had at the time was uh, my then girlfriend who has family that lives in Long Island so you know I didn't know much about New York City I also thought that maybe planes crashing into towers or planes crashing into buildings was maybe something that would happen you know by accident I would think just because of the elevation of you know certain towers in New York City I was just you know a bunch of things ran through my head at that time I'm like man that's kind of weird like plane crash into the building that's you would think that you know they would try to avoid that or what's going on you know so I didn't think anything of it at first and then a few months later a second plane hits the other tower and I'm like, oh, this doesn't seem right, you know, and then now I'm getting a phone call from my dad um, asking where I'm at, and I tell him that I was in between classes and that I'm okay, and he goes, hey, just to let you know, like, there's something serious happening in New York City, and uh, if anybody asks you about me or who I am or where I'm at, uh, don't tell them, and the reason he's saying that is because he had just gotten out of the military in February of that year. So, of course, you know, um, I was worried. I was like, why is he telling me this? Like, what what does that mean? You know, I had no idea terrorism was not something that, you know, I was used to or familiar with. You know, I had no idea what was taking place. I never kept up with what was happening internationally at that time. And so, of course, now I'm instantly worried second thing I'm doing is like man I got to reach out to my my girlfriend you know and she didn't live with me in Kentucky I had just left Missouri which is where I graduated high school she was still back in Missouri with her family and um, you know we were just trying to figure out the long distance thing you know um, and so I call her and I'm like hey uh, I just heard about New York is your family okay uh, I know that they live in Long Island but you know I just wanted to call and see what's going on and she's like yeah I've been talking to my dad and my mom and 
you know, she's let me know that I think her family is, is good to go. They don't really know what was going on. It's, it's only been like an hour since that event happened. So, you know, of course, I'm like, man, this is chaotic. Like, what's happening, you know? And as I go throughout the rest of my day after that, they canceled class. I, I go back to class, and uh, the instructor was like, I'm sure that you all are aware by now that um, there was a uh, an attack on one of the towers. And this attack has, uh, um, they're trying to attribute it to who it might have uh, caused the attacks, and we're still trying to, um, you know, figure things out, so we're dismissing class today. And, you know, of course, I'm like, man, like, what is going on? You know, that they're dismiss dismissing class. Nobody's, nobody's staying in class. Like, <laughs> what, what do I need to do? You know, are we under attack? Are we going to go to war? Like, am I have to worry about my dad? So... Um, what's up, Mr. Kiesling? How you doing? No worries. Don't, uh, I just started. <laughs> um, I wasn't late. I was like two minutes before. Um, so of course, you know, a million things are running through my head. Like what's going on and what, what do I need to do? What can I do? Is there something that, you know, I need to be doing? Uh, who do I need to call? Um, I'm 18 years old, so empathy and sympathy for tragic events I, I really don't know how to respond to things like that so um, it's a much different environment for me you know a million things are going on so the only thing I could do is go home and turn on the TV and find out what exactly was happening and you know it was at that moment where I'm watching the news and you know it's been a little bit of time now where my school was in relation to my house it was about a 30 minute drive um, and cell phones were still really new at that time, so uh, my I didn't have a a full up. I, I had to pay by the minute kind of deal, so I didn't have many minutes left. And I was like, I'm not gonna waste my minutes. I'll just wait till I get home. My dad's got it on the news, and that's when we seen the the first tower fall. You know, a little while later, like, holy smokes, is that supposed to happen? You know, a plane crash into one of the buildings. It, was that something that was supposed to take place? You know. Um, I didn't know I'm in Kentucky, you know, like, we don't have towers, we don't have buildings like that. Uh, the only thing that we have to worry about is the dam. Uh, but of course, my dad's freaking out because he just got out of the military, he was still on terminal leave. You know, he's concerned about getting recalled back into the service or them turning off his uh, active duty um, term. So, you know, I'm, I'm worried too, you know, like, I'm worried for my dad, what, what does he have to do? And he found out a little while later that he didn't have anything to worry about, um, but of course he was like, well, I'm, I serve my country and now something happens. You know, I've been in 20 years and like, I feel like I need to go back. So, you know, those conversations were happening between my dad and my mom. Wasn't really involved in that too much with my brother and I. He did sit us down and eventually talk to us like on a serious note, kind of kept it to the point to where like, hey, don't let anybody know about what I've done in the military, who I am, who I'm affiliated with. Um, those kinds of things because you know people are going to start asking questions and and maybe causing issues uh, so you know of course we understood and we just went about our day um, you know after the towers fell of course I was tragedy struck you know talking about the casualties and the news broadcasting like people just in complete chaos you know and it was it was interesting um, to see like how everything, how the whole world, you know, pretty much just stopped and slowed down, at least in my perspective. Um, Captain Memory, how you doing? Welcome, uh, Mr. Seamus O'Donnell. Welcome, sir. I hope you're still around. Um, so yeah, it was interesting to see how the whole world just kind of went on pause. You know, it's like, you know, different people from different places were reacting and responding to this event, and you know. The only thing I could do was sit there and watch, and I felt really terrible because I'm like, what am I going to do? Like, what do I do? You know, these people are suffering in New York, um, and, you know, they're trying to find their loved ones, and thousands of people's lives have paused, and after a while, I realized there's not much I could do, um, but what the next thing that I did witness was how much patriotism um, basically skyrocketed ever, ever since then. It, would, it didn't take more than 24, maybe 48 hours where 
you would see almost an American flag on every single house, you know, hung up on the outside. Or driving down the street, you saw people putting up signs saying, you know, we're thinking of New York. Um, you know, they're putting up their flags or they've got things going on, you know, outside of their house, like talking about how they're wanting to support, you know, New York City. And, you know, we didn't have social media. You know, that wasn't kind of a thing for Facebook, you know, wasn't really around for that. I mean, I do remember Facebook being a thing while I was in Kentucky. I think I only knew one person um, that actually was on Facebook. So I don't know what that communication looked like in social media at the time. I, I wasn't a part of it. Um, but I mean, I saw the whole entire United States of America basically wake up. You know, the, uh, that was one thing that I, I witnessed personally was you couldn't go down more than a block without seeing somebody having the American flag posted on the front of their house or some type of red, white, and blue flying somewhere, whether it's on their vehicle or not. So I was like, man. And I think, you know, uh, yeah, MySpace, Bo. <laughs> yeah, MySpace was the thing. Exactly right. Um, which I don't think I looked at MySpace the same way I do as Facebook. You know, scrolling through the news feed um, as much as, as Facebook is nowadays. Um, so it's uh, it's interesting to you know put myself back in that time, uh, and it went on for quite some time before you know that. American flag stand up or the, the the conversations of what took place you know every single day it was in the news right trying to figure out the what took place trying to determine who did this you know who stopped our world who attacked us who is the ones and who are the responsible people for what just took place and are we going to expect more like is there more coming you know that was the twin towers that was a hit right on our buildings like militarily you would think that a giant attack like that would follow something else um and that never happened it was all asymmetric after that you know and i'm sure on the battlefield um wherever we were at that point in time um i wasn't familiar with our footprint in 2001 um obviously our force posture significantly changed quite rapidly uh we were forward deployed military forces overseas uh, we invaded Iraq and and you know the rest is history from there um, Chris Gulick says that they had a live journal <laughs> interesting um, so it's you know that's my experience of you know today 18 years ago it's amazing for me to think that 18 years has passed since then um, I remember it like it was yesterday. To be alive during such a impactful time in history um, and to now be able to tell my story to my children, who obviously were born after that event and now see me in uniform, um, you know, that will forever be a part of my life and anyone that was around me at that time, you know. Um, you know, it's pretty surreal to think that that something like that so tragic happened 18 years ago. And, you know, New York City is still feeling it. Um, yeah, they have an amazing memorial. I did get the chance to go out to Ground Zero after the attacks um, the following year. And to be quite honest, I wish I would have gone to see New York City before the towers fell. And, uh, you know, that would have been completely surreal. And it I did get to see what the new building looked like um, several years later. So I, I saw Ground Zero when they were first kind of cleaning things up. You know, the buildings were still tattered in the surroundings. There was still a bunch of rubble on the ground. Um, there was thousands of posters and flyers and pictures and flowers and you name it. Like if there was a teddy bear on the street or if there was a post-it of looking for someone or if there are names a memorial or I mean it went for I mean thousands thousands of stuff and I, I'm sh I think I got pictures of it somewhere on an old camera but um, something that I probably have to dig up you know on an old cell phone somewhere but uh, yeah it was unbelievable to see what Ground Zero looked like soon after that so um, 
Chris Gulick says, 18 years ago, Todd and I turned a tragic event into something very special. Well, that's amazing that you have that memory for you 18 years ago. Um, JFK assassination. <laughs> yeah, that would have been something surreal to live up, live into. Um, yeah, most people do remember where they were during that day and September 11th. Uh, one of the stories that I'll never forget was my 06 um, back at Scott Air Force Base in Illinois. He was actually at the Pentagon whenever it got hit. And his deputy um, was a civilian at Scott Air Force Base. And his, him and his deputy both were at the Pentagon at the same time in the same uh, chain of command as well. And so he was sharing his story about how, you know, the chaos was taking place and how Washington, D.C., around the Pentagon was completely shut down and how there was mass chaos going on, um, especially with coordination of where military personnel should be in relationship to the actual attack of the Pentagon. Um, because obviously, if you've ever been to Washington, D.C., um, one traffic accident locks you down for about 200 miles in any direction on I-95, east, west, and north. Um, so it it's uh, two and a half hours minimum to get anywhere. So you can imagine something like this being um, taking place in Washington, D.C., what the traffic was like. <laughs> it, I'm pretty positive it was impossible. People were probably in traffic. They, I heard that he was in traffic and he left his vehicle and on the interstate, got up and walked off because everybody was doing it. Everybody was actually getting out of their vehicle and, and walking <laughs> to wherever they're going um, to get into a free area where they can get picked up or transited somewhere else. Uh, that's how crazy it was. So uh, I'm sure most of you probably remember uh, where you were during that day. And uh, I'm sure there are probably friends of yours that have m stories similar. Um, I, I personally don't know anybody that was directly impacted by uh the attacks on the towers or Pentagon or, or losing life on the Pennsylvania flight. Um, but uh, it was kind of one of those things like where you know, I didn't know where I was, where I fit in in the whole scheme of things. You know, it, it impacted America. Obviously, it impacted my father because he had just retired. Um, I'm still in college. I'm 18 years old. I don't really know much what was going on. Um, you know, I didn't really know where I could fit in. I just had to continue life, right? And kind of keep up with what the news was saying, what was going on. Um, so, you know, it was, it was interesting to see how quickly things changed. And one thing I can say is that I'm happy to see that, how much the American flag showed up, you know, on pretty much everybody's doorstep. That was amazing to me. And I wish that we had that same level of patriotism. I mean, you, you couldn't find one person or the other who didn't appreciate their neighbor at that point, you know. And, you know, we don't see that as often anymore, unfortunately. So... Um, Chris Gulick says, uh, Todd and I were among the first civilians to visit the Memorial 9-12. Wow. You visited right afterwards? <laughs> In 2011. Okay, I see. Um, Ten years afterwards. That's right, yeah, because I think they inaugurated the uh, Memorial um, in 2011, ten years after the event happened. So, yeah, it's a beautiful memorial. If you haven't had the chance to see it in person, um, I would definitely take the opportunity to go to New York if you can. Uh, of course, that's going to be a trip you'd have to plan out. Um, but it's definitely one of those uh, things that I would at least make an effort to go see in person because it's breathtaking, um, simply breathtaking, to see the new tower and, and the memorial fountains that are, that are near it where the two towers stood before they were taken down. Um, yep, some of us do still have it. <laughs> um, so, uh, I appreciate you letting me take a few minutes to kind of, you know, share my story with today. Um, that wasn't originally the plan. I, like I said, when I first scheduled this live feed, I originally was just asking questions, and I'm not positive, but I did not pay attention to the date originally until... You know, I was like, holy smokes, tomorrow, September 11th, that's going to be a somber day for a lot of people. I mean, 18 years is a lot of time. You know, that's, that's no small feat. A couple of the things that I've been seeing going around the Internet was our pictures of kids during 2001. Um, you know, some holding American flags or some 
just kind of standing around where it says we were kids then but we're not kids anymore and they're like grown up and they're in uniform and here they are defending their nation you know going and taking it to the enemy those are pretty powerful photos you know if you ask me like they're now old enough to fight for their country um and i'm sure a lot of people a lot of children at that point you know grew up without their family member or they were impacted indirectly um, but they also grew up knowing that when they're 18 years old they wanted to do something and that was protect our nation and hey more power to them welcome to my party you know kind of deal like please and thank you you know for your service and your sacrifice that you've already sacrificed enough and now you're willing to join the fight and be a part of America's uh, greatest military in the world um, yeah so there's that <laughs> Um, I did propose the questions, and I did have Jack Kiesling, uh, the infamous question asker, uh, throw out throw out some questions for me. I don't have them written down, unfortunately, but I got a few snapshots of things that he asked me. Uh, what would what was my what would be my favorite military aircraft of all time, and why? And then he asked a secondary question like what is my favorite World War II generation aircraft and so um, you know I've been in the Air Force going on 15 years now and when I was a kid I grew up actually loving the Blue Angels of all things um, you know the Blue Angels were amazing that was when air shows were really popular you couldn't go to a military base without knowing that an air show or something was going to be taking place and that was something that uh, I uh, wanted to go out and see as a kid I looked forward to them you know the air shows are great you got to see all the planes they're opened up you get to walk through them you get to actually feel and see these gigantic aircraft and their missions and you know then the flyovers were fantastic and then you had the, the guys jumping out of airplanes and you know that was something that I grew up knowing and you don't see that too much anymore <laughs> AWACS <laughs> uh, Jack Kiesling why are you infamous uh, well now you are infamous because your book <laughs> You, you remain in infamy so far, and soon you will be famous, I hope, because of your book, because it is great to read. Um, he is a question master, I, I agree. So as a kid, those were one of my favorite aircraft. My father, he's always been a fan of the A-10. Um, I grew up liking the A-10s too. Tank busters, amazing planes, right? Um, but one of my favorite, personally, since I've been in the military, um, I originally started out flying on the B-52s. I will always love the B-52. That plane's am amazing. Um, it's been around for s going on 70 years now. They've refitted it multiple times. Um, you know, it's a freaking psychological ops defamation of, like, your well-being. Like, if you see that thing flying over, you know serious business is about to happen because it's massive. It makes a lot of smoke. It's big and angry, and it can take out anything in a matter of minutes. So I love the B-52, but, but that is not my favorite aircraft. My favorite aircraft would be this plane right here. That is a C-17 Globemaster sitting in the background. I am currently deployed in Al-Udeed. Um, I uh, decided to support a mission um, in a different country from there and I flew in on this aircraft and um, so it was kind of one of those like somber moments for me because I was stationed at the headquarters Air Mobility Command at Scott Air Force Base Illinois and uh, while stationed there my my job was to support air mobility and uh, that included the C-17, the C-130s, um, the, C, uh, the KC-10s, air refuelers, um, doing air mobility operations in and out of theater. So my my experience with them, like I've trained on them, I learned about them, I knew the air crew, I used to talk to them all the time. Um, so this is me actually on the tarmac in Kandahar, and uh, that C-17 I flew in on on a uh, on a mission, and um, what we were doing was doing a resupply, and so, uh, you know, I had the privilege of flying in on one of those. I, I call these kind of like the Cadillac of uh, of the air, because 
it's kind of one of those planes where like it basically flies itself and um well, i won't forget the car question i promise mike uh so I, flying in on this thing like uh, i flew in at night and it was kind of crazy because everything is blacked out you know and um we have a bunch of cargo in the back and <clears throat> where we were going was going to be an amazing adventure and uh i i flew in just as a kind of a guest ride almost so i wasn't really it's kind of one of the perks of being deployed you know you know the air crew you kind of get opportunities that not everyone else will so that picture picture specifically you know I, I had it taken from one of the air crew members and then my wife Alyssa um made this really cool photo where she put the I am an American airman I am a warrior quote on there um and if anybody knows anything about uh creeds those are the first two sentences to uh the airman's creed um so I thought that was really special because I was deployed and she saw my photo pop up and so she took it an extra step and actually created something really amazing for me to put up on my wall and then it was printed out and it was actually hung up in my command uh, with the I am an American Airman I am a warrior printed on it as well so people knew where where I was and they they had a, a pretty much a memento of me and that's Staff Sergeant Ruffin at the time so I was not commissioned yet. I was um, still enlisted at that time. So one of my most memorable deployments. Um, so that's my favorite aircraft, uh, C-17 Globemaster. Um, yeah, it's crazy that a mobility plane is one of my favorites, but it's just beautiful plane. Um, if you get a chance to look at the, the aircraft, um, take a look at its countermeasures. It does these things called the angel burst whenever it does countermeasures for uh, weapon systems being launched at it and it's probably one of the most miraculous things you've ever seen and the aircraft is is basically like a giant fighter jet but for mobility and the thing has so much maneuver capability it's it defeats all odds um, basically and it just looks impressive um, it's got a lot of really great features on it when you fly up in the in the captain's area um, or in the cockpit rather um, there's a whole suite of electronics and when I was up there, the pilot and the co-pilot weren't even like holding the joystick at all. They were, the plane was basically flying by itself, so that was pretty wild. Um, yeah, the Death Angel, exactly, Jack. Um, Bo Jameson says his favorite aircraft was, or the AWACS plane. Um, that's his favorite, and he's been on the C-5, but not the C-17. Yeah, C-5, that one's a whole other beast you know to think that that thing even flies is amazing i've seen it take off and land uh, when i was in texas and it's just amazing if, if you don't know what the c5 is google it and you can see how large that thing is all right so my favorite world war ii aircraft i've got a few that i like the p51 mustang is probably um one that i probably should like the most just because whenever you go from enlisted to commissioning um they call you a mustang and the P-51 Mustang is kind of like that symbol, right? And it's a pretty cool plane. Um, there's some other ones out there that I have always loved seeing. Uh, the Corsair for one. I think uh, Brent Hammerand and I were talking about the Corsair yesterday. He sent me a video. Amazing aircraft. The freaking multi-guns on that thing and the props. Uh, beautiful plane. But one of my all-time favorite is something that most people don't really know. is is uh, called a P-38. And it's a uh, twin fuselage aircraft, um, single cockpit, uh, twin turbine engine, um, but it also has a connected tail fin. And uh, ultimately, when these were originally designed, uh, what they were trying to do was improve the stability and aerodynamic capability of their fighter aircraft. And uh, they thought that having a twin fuselage um, twin turbine engine would help improve aerodynamics and flexibility and ability to fly uh, more agile. Uh, so the P-38 came out. There was also a P-58 um, that was similar to this aircraft. It was uh, their, what's it called, uh, the, the other model that they were testing out, like their concept aircraft, uh, but the P-38 was the one that was fielded. And uh, the reason why I like this one is because it's super unique. Um, it doesn't have a lot of the other qualities of uh, some of the other military aircraft. It was one that was 
incredibly versatile. Um, unfortunately, it didn't do a lot of uh, what the military wanted it to do as far as actually deployment of it. Um, so it's kind of one of those things like where uh, it was kind of one of those forgotten treasures. And I, I really liked it because I had a little model toy of the P-38. So my when my when I was younger, I used to collect these little air, airplane figurines that I used to have, kind of like matchbox cars for most kids, but I had planes also. Um, and I r always remember playing with, uh, mine was silver, um, a P-38. And so I, I just remember that plane from childhood and uh, to help answer the question, I, I was like, well, I, I think I'll pick the P-38 because it's, it's a really unique aircraft and I don't know too many. Um, yeah, P-58 chain lightning, exactly, Jack. Clarence Kelly Johnson at Lockheed. Look at you knowing the knowledge about these aircraft. Uh, wait a minute. You, so your grandfather flew Corsairs. Awesome. And uh, is this this one is your favorite too? Okay. Or Corsairs. Corsairs are your favorite? By the way, the Corsair is amazing. If you see the naval variant, uh, that's the one that has the, the wings that fold up like this uh, on its side. And it's got a, it's a single prop. Um single cockpit and it kind of sits at a slant like that and the, the wings fold out it's, it's a really cool plane uh, I think I had a model of those also when I was a kid but those are my two favorite aircraft um, C-17 Globemaster it was one of my favorite planes I love flying on it I love being in them I, I love seeing how they they adapted and matured over time um, I just think it's a beautiful aircraft when looking at it you just cannot help but say wow you know um like i said other airplanes b-52s and the blue angels were some of my favorites growing up but c-17 all-time favorite um the other question that jack asked was uh something that i actually had to think a lot about and i don't know if i still have an answer for but he asked what military leader uh from the 20th century would be someone that uh, i would want to be mentored by or want to to be around or I can't remember the entire verbiage of the words. I would look it up, but my phone is being used so I can see your guys' comments. Um, so, you know, I asked my classmates, actually, and they I asked them the same thing. I was like, hey, what military leader in the 20th century uh, would you, you know, I guess learn from? And, you know, the, the 20th century is from 1901 to 2000, in case you guys don't know the timeline. So what happened in, in that amount of time, in 100 years? You have World War One, you have World War Two, you have the Vietnam War, um, and then there's other, several events that go on. And then in the 70s, you have v like Vietnam, right? And then you have the first Gulf War in, in the 90s. Um, and then later on, you have early 2000, um, you know, you have Africa in there somewhere with President Clinton. Um, so you have several things taking place. And uh, so I'm going to read this comment by Jack first. So my grandfather and both of his sons, my dad being one, were combat pilots. Can't help by now the histories and love the planes. Yeah, I mean, I would love the planes too. Combat pilots, especially in airframes back then. Um, could you imagine the level of knowledge that those pilots had to know then uh, in comparison to now? You would think that, um, that the difference in knowledge would be like they had a new uh, engines, aerodynamics, uh, pitch and yaw forms, um, you know, things like that. Whereas now it's a lot more technical and a lot more TOs and execution of, you know, certain buttons, you know, to make sure that the plane takes off and flies. Not so much maintenance of uh, uh, equipment or engines or like knowing the ins and outs of like how to start the plane because of the props and things like that. So level of knowledge is vastly different. Um, but back to the 20th century leadership, though, um, you know, I, some uh, one one guy actually was like, if I had to pick one, it'd be Rommel. And if you're not familiar with that name, I would give you uh, the opportunity to go out and research who Rommel was. Uh, he was a German general during one of the most uh, trading times, um, you know, World War Two, and Rommel was a great military leader for his country. Um, I don't know too much about Rommel, but I was kind of impressed because, you know, like, hey, he picked somebody that was uh, not expecting. 
but I mean, when it comes to military leadership styles, I can see his points. Another one, um, I can't remember what he originally said. He, he kind of brought up some older generals I wasn't too familiar with um, their names, and I really hadn't thought about it, but I was trying to think. I was like, well, maybe what, I want to look at my dad's time frame because my dad was in the military, graduated or retired in 2001, so you know he was in from the 80s to 2001. So I was like, well, let's narrow my window down a little bit. That's the 20th century. What military generals were in during that time? Uh, Schwarzkopf was one. Um so I looked at some of Schwarzkopf's background, uh, tried to figure out, you know, who he was and what kind of person he was. I, the only thing I can recall was when my dad was getting deployed, his name was thrown out a few times. Um, and I feel terrible because I wish that I knew more about military leaders in the 20th century after he asked that question. So um, I'm going to have to look into it. Like I did reports on Andrew Jackson. You know, I could tell you all day long about Andrew Jackson and how he died even. Um, you know, I, I did reports on Civil War generals and things like that, where, but I haven't really researched too much in the 20th century time frame. Um, Chesty Puller, uh, Marine Corps general. Uh, everyone idolizes that man because of his, you know, uh, aggressive nature, and but he... He needed to be that way during that time. You know, Chesty Puller wasn't one to take shit from nobody. And I think people realized that. And, you know, I think he was the kind of leader that people needed at that time. Um, incredible man, a great leader, known even by his enemies as a gentleman, savage in battle but fair, loved his man above all else. See? Jack knows. Yeah, and I agree. I, from the short things that I did read about Erwin Rommel, because... I'll be honest, I used the Google box yesterday and I was sitting in bed and looked at all the military leaders at that time. Um, and I saw Erwin Rommel. I was like, hey, he's a German general. Like, let's read about this guy. And that was a fair statement by Jack. Um, he was somebody that was looked upon as a respected military leader, um, even with allied nations. You know, his name was uttered in other people's mouths. And people understood him for his tact, his capabilities, and his strategies were very sound and very military and, uh, above all else, um, humane in some instances. Um, had he not fought for Germany, Rabel would live in history as one of the greatest military leaders of all time. That's a pretty fair statement. I would have to agree based on what knowledge I have of him now. Um, I would say that there are even people today that studied Erwin Rommel and learned his strategies in war. Um, even the, the books and literature that I saw published, um, you know, from his leadership, um, there's tons of sources out there in literature that referenced Erwin Rommel's, um, strategies and his tactics during war and, uh, a lot of the references were, you know, idolizing his ability to think through problems and set up uh, troops in specific areas where, you know, the, the progression through war uh, was successful because of his decision-making skills. So, um, I would, honestly, I think if I read more, he would probably end up being one of my favorites also. Um, but you know, of course, with the grain of salt, right? You know, I'm very American, so um, nothing wrong with understanding somebody else's strategies and learning from how they did things, or at least understanding your enemy, right? Keep your friends close, but your enemies closer kind of deal. Um, so, yeah, I, I did look into the question a lot, and I really wanted to answer it with a, a justifiable response because, I mean, the 20th century was a long time. That's 100 years of uh, you know, leaders that came and gone, you know, during that window. And there was a lot of them from just from the initial searches I did, there was over 20 that were mentioned and I couldn't name all of them right now if I wanted to. Uh, I did name a few. Um, yep. Good night, Chesty, wherever you are. Exactly. Um, you know, there's plenty of, uh, leaders out there that were remarkable people and, if I had more time in my life, I would try to do my best to read on all of them. Um, 
<laughs> I'm very American. Yes, Chris, I am very American. <laughs> um, so I apologize for not giving you a, a direct answer on who those leaders are, but at least I mentioned a few, and hopefully that, you know, kind of paints a picture of uh, those those types of leaders that were there, and in, in, at least puts in the framework of, you know, the that generation. You know, you got to think about the timelines. Uh, basically, after I realized that window, I'm like, holy smokes, that was a hundred years of um, U.S. involvement in some of the most major conflicts of all time. Um, actually, the ma- the most uh, major conflicts of all time. So it's unbelievable to to see what the world endured during that time and what types of people, like just regular air breathing blood filled watered bags of intelligent life uh, directing military strategy and leading you know whatever successes um, you know those those are the types of people that uh, were born for a purpose and they serve their purpose I believe um, so those I thought those questions were Fantastic. So thank you, Jack, for asking those. Um, I, I don't feel as intelligent as I should be um, on those topics, but, um, you know, at least I shared some of the aircraft piece and the military leaders piece. Um, so I, I did have a couple other questions asked from Brent. Um, I think Mike Mitchell, uh, he said to make sure that I answered my, my car question at least. Uh, so that one, I I have always wanted a, a Dodge Viper. Um, when I grew up, when I was a kid, the Dodge Viper was one of those cars that I just kind of stood out to me. Um, you know, I didn't know any better at that time. I just looked at it. It was a supercar. It was cool. It was red. It had some great body lines. I thought it was really aggressive to think that a V12 engine was in it at one point and the v10 like holy smokes you know that car was powerful and then i grew up a little bit more started appreciating cars for what they were and you know i'm going to top fuel drag races with my dad uh i'm going to the drag strip myself as i got older you know seeing my friends race cars um and then i started appreciating the classics a little bit more starting learning about them and now car shows and things are some of my favorite pastimes. It's one of my favorite things to do on the weekends if there's a good car show to go to. I try to make it. Um, in fact, I have a whole page dedicated to nothing but cars. Um, but now, you know, I also found out that my dad growing up, he was a big car guy. And before he joined the military, he had a 1971 Chevrolet Camaro that he totaled in a car accident. Um, he came around a bank, went off into a ditch. Uh, I don't know what happened i think he was goofing around um went up into a tree and you know back then they didn't have safety mechanisms so airbags were non-existent um everything was solid steel so as he hit the tree his face hit the steering wheel when his face hit the steering wheel his his mouth hit the bottom of it and his teeth went through the bottom of his lip so he's got a gnarly scar sitting right there and he actually said that the molars in his mouth from the impact of him hitting the steering wheel shot out of his mouth and when it shot out it um, ended up getting lodged in what was left of the dash so that was pretty intense to me (laughs) Um, he said that after the wreck he you know he came to and he ended up walking all the way back home and you know he was all bloodied up and ended up telling I can't remember if his mom or his dad what had happened and they they ended up getting the car and towing it back to the house, and then he told me what he did with it. I didn't know this until about three or four years ago, but they took the motor out of it. His friend took the motor from him, bought it, I guess, because uh, he wanted it. They took the hood of the car, and hung it up in the barn, uh, but the rest of it they pretty much left it the way it was. And then they took it to my friend uh, David Henderson's house and uh, ended up burying it. In the backyard. Yep, they dug a giant trench and put the car in it and put a bunch of dirt over the top of it. I was like, huh, that's interesting. So somewhere in some guy's backyard, 
there is a 1971 Chevrolet Camaro buried. <laughs> so now one of my favorite cars is that. I want a 71 Camaro really bad because I want to try and restore it and drive around and kind of get the experience of what my dad did when he was younger. Um, I have pictures of it on my page. I didn't add it to my little sweet picture feed on here, but I'll share it later on. Um, I didn't have time to set it up before I got on here today. Um, but um, definitely a car that I really want to uh, try and own someday. And I'm going to jump out of my phone because I know that there was another question asked. And I want to make sure that I answer them because the whole purpose of this is to make sure that I answer these questions. Uh, oh, the aircraft one. That's right. Brent also asked me if I could own any type of aircraft, which wouldn't it be? And I responded to him, you know, I have never thought about that. And he goes, well, why not? You've been in traffic. You know, like that should be something that you could think about while sitting in traffic. And <laughs> um, He's probably right. I probably could have thought about that at one point. So I'll tell you like one of my things I, I seriously thought about and considered um, when I moved out here. So California, uh, in, in case you're not familiar with the area I'm at, uh, I'm on the literally the west coast where Vandenberg Air Force Base, where like, you know, where that heel of California is, where I don't know how to do it, like right uh, there in that corner where California is at. Um, that's where Vandenberg Air Force Base is. And uh, so we're less than a mile or so from the ocean. Um, but you can't really see it. You, you, you hear it, but you can't see it. Um, but the cities around here are uh, very small, and they are not very prominent for housing and cheap. They are poorly maintained, and the housing costs out here are outrageous. So my wife was looking at other areas that are affordable to live in, and one of those towns was called Bakersfield. That was like a two and a half hours away, which I totally understand where she's coming from. The houses out there were beautiful, um, very affordable, right in our income bracket, and something that we could have managed. But the distance was really far, so I told her, I was like, you know what, if we're going to live in Bakersfield, I'm going to learn how to fly a helicopter, and I'm going to get my pilot's license. I only need 250 hours to fly a helicopter. The training is actually right down the road from Vandenberg Air Force Base. I'll do it in my off time. I'll uh, sell my car. I'll use that money to um, put towards a motorcycle, and I'll go buy a helicopter. You know that sounds crazy, right? Uh, but I looked online, and I found these like these two-seater helicopters that you could buy for like sixty grand. I was like, "What? You could buy a helicopter for about the same price as a brand new suburban? You know, a 2019 suburban? We went and actually test drove seventy-five thousand. If you want it fully loaded." Not fully loaded comes to about fifty-five thousand, brand new, right? So I'm like, well, why would I, you know, do that when I could buy a helicopter and I can fly from Bakersfield, you know, with my pilot's license? I don't know what the fuel cost would, like, you know, would it cost and and the fees and things like that. But um, I kind of like weighed it. I was like, well, that would get me to work in about thirty minutes. I can land at the local airport, jump on a motorcycle, drive down to base, do my job. Then get done, take my motorcycle, park it in the hangar, get in the helicopter, fly home, and boom. You know, it's like less than an hour. <laughs> I could do that. Totally doable. Um, so that would be something that I would love to do. Actually, I almost um, joined the military to become a helicopter pilot. And I definitely thought about it a few times. And I even contemplated uh, when I commissioned about flying. Uh, I had the conversation with Alyssa. I was like, hey, would you think about me becoming a helicopter pilot? And that was during my application timeline because that would have made the difference as to whether or not I was going to get a flight physical or just a standard physical. Uh, flight physical would have taken a few extra steps to complete. Um, and so I was like, well, I don't want to risk my chances of not passing the flight physical and then eliminating my opportunity to commission because uh, I have bad, bad eyes. Uh, I had them corrected 10 years ago. And... I probably would have been okay, but I didn't want anything to keep me from commissioning. So I went with the standard physical, and um, the conversation of being a helicopter pilot kind of went out from there. Um, but yeah, I would love to buy a helicopter and and own one of those. I think that'd be excellent. I do remember a guy living in New Mexico right down the road from my dad. Um, he actually built a plane in his garage. That was crazy. Um, and whenever he actually 
got it finished, he took it out to the flight line and flew over the houses and we were standing outside and he was like waving the wings, you know, at us. And when he was waving the wings, we were underneath him, like waving to him. So that was pretty cool. Um, Jack Kiesling says he wants a Cessna Mixmaster. I'm going to have to look up what that is because I, I don't know. I know Cessnas are much smaller planes, probably easy to fly, easier to fly. I, I remember when I was in the, I wasn't in Civil Air Patrol, but I was using a program to learn how to fly uh, for a couple months there. And one of the first planes I ever flew myself was a Cessna. Um, so that was kind of fun. I, I knew the whole rudder pitch yaw you know, adjustments kind of thing. I, I flew it on my own with, with a instructor, but um, didn't log any flight hours. It was just kind of like one of those uh, morale flight times kind of deal. Um, does Vandenberg Air Force Base ever do an open house? Well, I'll tell you what. Vandenberg Air Force Base, so every military base, um, civilians uh, have the ability to access um, with an ID card, and if you have a sponsor, then that military member can get you on. Um, so, like for instance, at Peterson, there is a is an air museum on the base in Colorado, and civilians can go up to the visitor center and request a pass to go visit the air museum on the base. Uh, same thing with the Air Force Academy. You can drive right onto the Air Force Academy and um, go to the visitor center and actually shop there and stuff. Um, not a lot of people know that. But most bases, um, if if you know somebody that lives on one or is stationed at, you just ask a friend and they can sponsor you on. I mean, I drive my wife's parents or wife's mom onto base all the time, and she doesn't ever have to get a visitor's pass usually because she's only on here for a few hours. But just hop in the car and then come on in. Uh, back in the day, they used to have the bases open up to civilian population whenever they were doing air shows uh, where you can come on and see the planes and um, you know, see the different vendors and the different organizations and stuff, but they canceled those a long time ago. Uh, the DOD took that budget away where Air Force bases were. Uh, some bases still do, not all of them. Now they're a lot more privatized, so they, they still host air shows in some cities. Um, but, uh, yeah, so if you're interested in visiting a base, just ask a military friend. They can get you on. Uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base is actually kind of cool because here on this base there's actually a space museum which is really strange to say because like whoa what's in a space museum <laughs> like do they have particles do they have pictures of black holes is there a bunch of like pictures of planets that are round on the wall uh, no actually the space museum here is really cool because they have a a control center not a, not a mock-up, but the actual control center uh, from one of the launch facilities. My kids are coming in from the park, um, which means it's almost 6 o'clock, so, and they're probably really tired. So they might bombard me here in a minute, so excuse me. But yeah, there's a, uh, a space museum on the base, which got to, uh, has a lot of space history stuff here. So um, my computer's trying to restart, so hold on one second. All right, what's the matter? You Okay. She said Allie, so checking on her. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, Jack Kiesling. It's a twin engine and a pusher-puller configuration with a twin boom tail, kind of like a P-38 tail. Oh, wow. Interesting. I'll have to take a look at that. And Mike Mitchell, Cessna will cost cheaper than any World War II war. Oh, yeah, that's, that's no doubt. World War II aircraft. Um, you know, the amount of money it costs to keep them flying in the air, even let alone uh, uh, refurbished to where they're in condition without them failing and dilapidating right where they're sitting. Um, yeah, it would cost more than a, a current Cessna. Uh, a space museum is just a big space. Ha ha ha. Funny. That is pretty funny, Chris. Um, so, yeah, the, there are a lot of really cool things on some of the military bases, and, you know, I, I wish that they would open them up to the public, but there are reasons, right? <laughs> There's always reasons why military bases are secure and protective of the personnel that are on them. Um, you know, we are here to do a mission, and our mission is usually tailored to what types of units are on that base. Uh, and of course, we are the Department of Defense, so those reasons are there to protect national security and keeping them locked down 
um, and is, is a protection of us, but also a protection for civilian population because you wouldn't want a ton of civilians being on base um, just kind of nilly walking around doing whatever they want. And then, of course, we are in a time of war now and evacuation has to happen. Um, so, you know, those things are uh, very important to consider. Force protection measures are a very real thing. All right, so I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, thanks for joining me today. I got on at 5 o'clock. I decided to take a few minutes and share my story about September 11th. You know, by all means, if you have a story and you want to share it, I know some of my friends here, like Jack, for instance, shared a few posts about the towers and what times they're going down uh, today. That was kind of awesome to to see that timeline in reality again. Uh, and, you know, everybody has their own story about where they were, time, and place, location uh, during today. Um, 18 years, never forget, right? September 11th, super tragic day. And uh, I'm sure that, you know, you guys will never forget where you were at those moments. And, um, you know, we don't talk about it as much anymore until the day comes around. And, you know, by all means, share your stories because, you know, it's part of your life. Nothing wrong with that. Unfortunately, a lot of other lives were impacted by it, and that's what we have to pay respects to is all the first responders that um, risked their lives going into the towers and all the Daddy? people that were taken hostage and Daddy? utilized as a, can you get me a, drink? a tactic to attack our nation. So. Daddy, can you get me a drink? Yes, ma'am, just one second, okay? Let me finish this, and I'll, I'll get you something, okay? All right, and then, uh, of course, I had a few questions from Jack Kiesling about the... Um, my favorite aircraft, as well as the 20th century leader. Um, thanks for listening to me on my ideas on those. Uh, my, my daughter is running in now crying, so I wonder what's uh, happening. <laughs> um, and, you know, look out for my next Daddy. post. It'll be on Monday. <laughs> Aw, I'm sorry. Was she trying to get you back inside? This is my youngest, Aspen. So thanks again, everybody. I'm going to wrap it up here. My <laughs> girls are coming in from the park. She's smiling now because she's on camera. Um, I appreciate you guys tuning in and watching me. Uh, this has been What's Up Wednesday on What's Up Chuck with your man, Chuck Ruffin. Daddy, thanks again for being I here. I hope you guys have a, a great time, Daddy. a great day, great time spending with Daddy, your family on September 11th. Be sure to pay your respects. And uh, I hope to see you guys again soon. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it.